Because of the brain drain, developing countries uh, is still under the development and they have, no uh, they have no opportunity to develop themselves. So in, in that occasion, we are happy to give opportunity to develop the, themselves. So we are happy to propose. Today in my speech, I have two things to talk about. In the developing country, because of the brain drain, they, uh, they have to suffer from the difficulty to develop and citizens still suffer. And secondly, uh, in our side of the house, people, uh, young generation, stay, have to stay for certain people. What it is, uh, it can be a better scenario to developing countries. So before moving to my argument, I'd like to uh, explain the definition in our side of the house. After the uh, students, after the graduation from the, their university, we'd like to acquire themselves to work in their country for uh, for certain years, for example, two or three three years. So in that occasion, the work time should be decided based on their each country situation. And if they if uh, if they don't follow our requirement, we are happy to punish them. So then, so let me go to my argument. Firstly, uh, in developing country, why uh, your uh, brain brain drain is bringing to the harm harm to developing country itself? Because in the, uh, because uh, in developing countries, uh, in the con in the context of developing countries. People still live in the situation of poverty, and they see a lack of uh, uh, fundamental fundamental things uh, because there there is in the developing countries there is less accessibility to fundamental things. For example, food and water, or education, or med medical, and etc. etc. So in that occasion, we need more industry uh, and we need more de development uh, in order to be free from such poverty situation or uh, less, ac uh, less accessibility to fundamental things. So however, due to the brain, brain drain, it cannot be achievable in their developing countries. Why? Uh, why brain drain occurs in developing countries because in the university, uh, students uh, can get high level education in the, uh, in the university. For example, they can study uh, the chemical or they can learn the programming and etc. etc. So in that occasion, uh, in the in the term, during the time of university, students can get a specific, specific knowledge and they can get a specific experience. However, after, after the graduation from, the, from their university, they, students, uh, uh, students tend to go out to their mother countries. Why is it so? Uh, uh, I have two reasons in that, on that point. Because because uh, in compared with the developing countries, 
salary is higher higher in the in the case of other, uh, developed country. So, and and secondly, uh, in the developing countries, there is not enough cooperation or account company to hire the students or citizen of the other one. Uh, other uh, developing country. So in that occasion, uh, people, people, people have the difficulty to get a sustainable job, and so so that's why uh, people are uh, likely to go out of their mother country later, please. And and that's why in developing countries there is simple uh, labor working, which just give. Uh, give only cheap salary do does exist and and um, in the uh, in labor in the case of labor working uh, people have to work under the, under the very bad working condition and and the moreover uh, as MNC incentive they think in developing countries there are a few people uh, worth to hire so in that occasion, they have no motivation to build their company in developing in developing country itself. And later, and moreover, for example, uh, if they get the qualification of the doctor, however, they go to another country. In that occasion, developing countries has the still lack of hospital or medical uh, medical medical or there is not uh, still not enough. And secondly, why in outside the house uh, we can bring the better scenario to the developing countries? Because uh, in outside the house, after the uh, as I already said, after the graduation, students have to stay for certain certain period in their mother country. So, <laughs> so for for Norwegian the people, they. Uh, if they have to stay for a certain period, they try to create a company, for example, a venture company or etc. Because in order to utilize their the skills they have, uh, in order to utilize the knowledge they have, uh, they can get from their university. Yeah. So in that occasion, as the MNC incentive, they try to build a company that uh, in developing country yeah. itself because uh, in order to make profit and they uh, in the de in developing countries there are people who are hire uh, who are work was to hire so they try to build a company uh, in developing uh, company in developing in developing country itself and due to uh, such scenario we can gather income tax or corporation tax etc in the country in that occasion, we can get more monetary resources from them, and we can spend spend more various resources. For example, food or education or um, education or medication. So it leads to a better scenario to developing countries, and we have uh, we can get the opportunity to develop by themselves. So we are happy to propose. Thank you. Like the major case that coming from OG is that oh they like they're gonna solving the property 
by staying themselves, the like in, in the country. Number one, we don't we don't need that people will in, like magically like equip skills to be with this. And number two, we think that like the education or the technique is like still in a low degree, and they're not well set. I think that like I don't I don't know if they don't learn anything that, uh, for example, if they, they can go to like America to learn better like techniques, I, like and then contribute to like to, to back to the country. I, I don't know why that is not the contribution to the uh, like to women as well. So we don't see that the poverty issues that are coming from their side actually solve the problem, right? So three issues in my debate. First, I'm going to talk about why government there, there's no legitimacy for government to coerce people to live in certain life. Number two, we think that it's more like uh, counterproductive. And number three, why it is better to like link, uh, like link, um, link uh, this individual to the social need if they can have more freely to choose what they want, like at the end of the day, right? So firstly, why uh, government, like why government has no like. Uh, like uh, uh, legitimacy to coerce people to live in a certain times, right? Because we think that, um, like, we think that like individual is the person who know like what they want the best, and we think that like uh, to like uh, for example, we offer like uh, we offer scholarship to like to for them to study what they want. We think that it's better like they like in terms of like how they can like uh, discover themselves and link them to the social contribution is more likely to happen on our side because we think that like they can actually know knowing that how is the best contribution for themselves like for themselves to, to like to be this right so for example like um like uh, the problem that for the band, like let's engage with the problem the problem of band, uh, brand trends that are coming from uh, opening the government, right? Because we think, like, they're saying that oh people are staying in the country, so like we can make them to do something. But I mean like the country can also do something for like solving this problem, right? For example, we tax people like up like overseas, and uh, like uh, these type of like these type of money can also doing the contribution to like uh, uh, to, uh, to the country. We don't see that why necessarily individual has to be imposed and fixed in a certain. Like, like a workplace that they're like that they're trying to talk about, right? So we think that number two, why this is more like counterproductive? Because we think that that is more about a like it's more about the brain waves, right? Because we think that like uh, the global trade or the global community that exists on both sides, but the question that uh, then becomes that how can we achieve like better like country like uh, better country. Right? Because I think in the uh, in the context of the global trade, it's more like all, all the like uh, skills and technique company are based on those developed like the country. But if you do, if you if you don't have the chance to to build up the connection with like those those country, that is, uh, and that's gonna be like that's gonna be worse, right? Number two, we can, we can for example like it is uh, for example uh, like as we can see that it's Google that goes to like uh, Cambodia, Cambodia to set the like the uh, the, the uh, like to set the place, but the headquarter, the invention part, is still based on the United States. We think that to, uh, in order to like be more holistic and learn the skills, it's better for you to like go to the headquarter instead of like staying in the like uh, a manipulation uh, like a uh, field and like or like this kind of like lab uh, labor uh, laboring job at the end of the day. We think that that is not beneficial for like for for the individuals that uh, or like the country who want to perceive the higher goals for like for the goal. Right, and moreover, we think that, like, um, uh, for example, like uh, the the asset for those uh, kind of uh, for those developing countries is more like the ch uh, cheap uh, cheap labor force, uh, cheap labor forces for those kind of like low income job, and like for example that for example about Nikes, they set their like research center in the U S, but like we can also see that the factories of Nikes are like setting a lot of, in a lot of developing country. We see that if the if the country country still with this kind of in this uh, like sort of industrial sectors, if you imposing that people need to compete in those like uh in, in those industrial sector, it's less likely for them to like move move up, right? They, they will only stay in stay in competition and like in these kind of like labor intensive job instead of like learning skills to begin with. And why is that bad? The impact is that, for example, for those like lower edu like uh, education. Uh, like, uh, for example, like the students in the high school, that's even bad because once the like once the like uh, the students occupy all the like low uh, like labor inten uh, intensive job, then then like uh, the students in the high school that can uh, just finish the high school degree cannot compete with like people who start, uh, study like higher degree like uh, at the end of the day. We think that it, it further lower the pay of uh, like for example, it further even make the like the labor or like the 
the like the salary more cheaper, we think that it dec at the end of the day decrease the quality of like of, of everybody, right? So we think that why it is better for the in, like for for the individual like to, to to pursue their life because we think that like um in terms of like how you like con uh, contribute to the society, the the thing is you need to realize that there is a social need and then you you need to like uh, uh gen like generate the like awareness of like how you contribute to the society, but by do uh, by doing so, we think that it's better for an individual to decide what they like to do, and that they can like feel happy to contribute their skills in order to like move, uh, like push themselves further. Because we we think that once they feel that they belong to this society, uh, like where they feel that they belong to like certain community, they are more like they are more willing to uh, to contribute, right? So like just a simple example, because I am a one set of students, I want to debate as a one set of students, I want to like uh, like achieve higher goal, like uh, like achieve higher goal because I belong to this kind of community. That's why we think that the identity itself that things to if, if they can open like freely open and freely choose by them uh, uh, by themselves uh, and uh, like at the end of the day we think that that is kept, that is better for them to contribute. So uh, ladies and gentlemen we told you about two, like three things. Number one government has no legitimacy to like to infringe people's freedom uh, in terms of like uh, the right to choose their job where they live and the community that they want to spend their life and we think that is more counterproductive like uh, at the end of the day. That's why we're proud to oppose. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Country and go to the advanced country, find a job, it's okay. After that, 
those kind of people can send money. It's okay, it's not mutual exclusion at all. But secondly, more important to those thank you, unique problem of sending money is that it's just based upon their volunteer spirit, right? Because when, for example, once those kind of people get, get to advanced kind of national, nationality and drop through away their mother country nationality, we cannot oblige anymore. This is a fundamental problem on their side of this house. Thirdly, they talked about how those kind of people have to have, the, for example, connection with the company or CEO of the advanced country, etc. It's not also mutual exclusion. After spending certain period in mother country, they can do that. Why? No, thank you. Why soon? Why as soon as possible after graduating university, those kind of people have to make the connection. It's extremely, extremely uh, ambiguous. Second, I'm going to talk about why in this motion case we have the clear legitimacy to mobilize those kind of citizens. Firstly, on this point, the previous speaker talked about how, as for them, actually, what uh, to do, allow them to do what they want is extremely important in order to cultivate their own identity. Firstly, we do not deprive their life eternally, we just partially and temporarily restrict, no thank you, no thank you, their own identity. Because after spending certain period, they can choose anymore. We do not further extend that kind of period at all. That's not mutual exclusion. But secondly, more importantly, rather on our side of this house, those kind of people can feel the sense of belonging. Why is that? Because on our side of this house, those kind of people have to stay in the developing country. For example, doctor or skilled labor, etc. In this occasion, rather they can get more sickness from the citizens, for example, or company or country government then serve from the surrounding people, community, etc. In this occasion, rather they can feel their own happiness or sense of belonging, etc. This is a clear counter analogy. But what we what what, 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 what kind of legitimacy we are talking about? Well, firstly, what we have to talk about here is that those kind of university students are specially, very specially privileged in the developing country. Why? The, because the context of the developing country is that the real resource is extremely limited, the government budget is extremely smaller than the advanced country. But even in this occasion, those kind of tax is utilized for the university, university, much especially, for example, professor fee or experiment fee or so forth. Then university students are very specially privileged, much more than other students who as majority are, are still under the poverty line, sincerely need the water, for example, food, etc. In this occasion, they can, those kind of university students can safely con concentrate on their, for example, studying, etc. That's why they are specially privileged. Why this special privilege can be the reason to restrict their life? Two examples. First, in the case of actually, uh, sorry, what well, public servant actually they are specially privileged. For example, there is no risk to bankrupt, no risk to opt in the market competition, or salary is stable to up to some extent. Therefore, for example, they are right to strike, etc. to right, restrict it. This is different from no ordinary students, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, for example, for example, in the case of rich, they are specially privileged in the cap capital capitalistic society. They are as good as through the progressive tax, they are more severely restricted their own property. Therefore, those kind of special privilege can be the reason to restrict their life to be given. But secondly, more importantly, we do not eternally deprive their life, as I told you. We just temporarily restrict oh, their okay. thing. No, say greater, please. This is the concept of the other. In this occasion, as a concept of reciprocity, we say from the relationship to the duty and right, those kind of people have to do that. Why? Because in under our paradigm, we are happy to define new types of reciprocity. Because you, when you go to the university, actually you are specially privileged. That's why you should have the duty to stay in the developing country. Yes, as they stay in the developing country for certain period. We, what we have to recognize here is the situation is fundamentally different from the advanced country. Yes. Also take their money to go to the university as well as, as you said, they also pay the university. So no, no, no. Don't you think it's double penalty? First, okay, please. First, even though, firstly, in the most cases, in the case of a developing country, the those kind of government then saves uh, pays that to pay the fee instead of this is the main case. But secondly, more important, even though those kind of students then saves pay the fee, actually thanks to the thanks to the budget that kind of experiment, for example, professor fee is mainly occupied. This is fundamentally different case for this and German. That's why, in, as, as, as the concept of reciprocity, those kind of students are most should be obliged to stay in the developing country. Finally, I'm going to further extend my partner's uh, point, uh, especially concerning the after the proposal. What we have to recognize here is that even though one person just to spend just three or four years, it's beneficial. Why? Because when they leave mother country, actually new graduating students start to work in the developing country. Therefore, consistent benefit, consistent human resource will be kept on our side of this house. But secondly, more importantly, 
There are certain possibilities those kind of students still choose to stay in developing country. For example, they already create, for example, business network with local company, for example, get marriage, or for example, increase their wage inside of developing country, etc. Therefore, those kind of consistent benefits will be done on our side of this hub. How under their paradigm they can develop developing country? This is a duck on their side of this house. simplified and that's too condescending of a reason as to why developing countries have not yet developed. Thirdly, I'll look at the true reason as to why developing countries have yet to uh, develop and therefore show you why in our paradigm we can actually solve that uniquely. Um, all my rebuttals are integrated into my speech. The speech. Let's move on to the first point. Uh, government, okay, so basically let's review what my first speaker said on this first point. The government exists for the people, not the other way around. The government doesn't get to use citizens as robot slaves for a development and raising the economy, those sort of things. That is why, we, for example, we provide some public services to people, like basic infrastructure and whatnot, without telling them, oh, we're paying for this, now you have to suddenly, you know, like, uh, you, you now have to live, work at an industry that the government defines as being the most suitable for development, those sort of things. We don't restrict the freedoms precisely because freedoms is the end goal of why government pays for stuff in the first place. What does that mean, right? At the point in which the government, through this policy, tries to take away the right to choose their jobs because they can no longer work in the United States, when they try to take away the right to choose where they live because they can no longer go abroad, the right to build a community in which they want to spend their time in because they can't be in an American community or a Silicon Valley type community, or the right to pursue education because you can no longer do a doctoral thesis in America, that is precisely the deprivation of fundamental rights of the individuals to choose how they want to spend the rest of their lives. We don't really think that the fact that you pay several hundred dollars for lab equipment it thinks, like, allows for the government to suddenly say, hey, I don't think you should be studying medicine in the United States because what we need you to do is to build better machines in the factories in order to make better, I don't know, like, uh, better manufacturing plans, those sort of things, right? So basically, that's that. They haven't really proven to us why, when the end goal of the government is to be provide for the people, and the people, as my partner said, knowing what is best for them, we don't really think that they've proven to us why their things override, right? And then they said, it's only temporary. The question is, why only temporary? They haven't really defined why they're not going to be containing these people in their own countries forever, right? Because according to their, you know, they want to be, like, stick to their principles, basically they want to, the utmost important goal is to develop the country, so why not keep them in chain in there forever, right? And the, that doesn't, you know, and they also said, that you know, people will be thanked because of the contribution they make in their home country. They may be thanked, but that's as a result of taking away their right to choose where to work, right? So we don't really think that the forced choice is worth it, right? And we, they told us that, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's skip that. Anyway, the conclusion being that we give you a principled case as to why the right of individuals to choose their place of work, place of living, and those sort of things overrides the hundred dollars that's thrown into the university without them really telling us why. The fact that government provides social services means that government can use pawns as people as pawns for their big social economic development experiment. Right. Moving on to the next point, let's talk about the difficulty of a development. We don't really think that the result of like. Uh, what, what examples was given by Orji? Ghana, Senegal, is the result of not people not, like, pe educate people not remaining in that country. We believe that's rubbish, right? Regardless of how, what kind of people are in that country, the neoliberal global and financial and trade regime is precisely a thing that's disadvantaging the countries and making sure that they do not rise above countries in the West, right? What does that mean? It means World Trade Organization imposed tariff rates that makes it impossible for countries to protect their own domestic industries that can, you know, if protected by the countries, can compete with industries in America, in Japan, in China, those sort of things. It means that economic colonialism at the point in which multinational companies come in and extract resources and extract human labor from these developing countries and then 
put that for America where it's consumed and the money returns. That sort of cycle of economic colonialism that cannot be fought back just by throwing smart people into the process of manufacturing and extracting resources, those sort of things. Thirdly, it is the dependence of multinational companies as a result of lobbying by these rich multinational corporations into creating lax regulations or lax environmental laws or labor laws that make it impossible for the country to protect the citizens who are being attacked and exploited in these developing countries. The fact that you throw educated people into this mess the, uh, where the lax regulation or lax um, environmental standards or the fact that you cannot have the money because of uh, low tariff rates to protect your own industry is not development on their side, right? They have to prove to us why those structural issues are going to be solved by throwing smart people in, right? So what is the issue that we've identified instead? It is precisely the fact that these countries, as a government, do not have, for example, the strength to impose policies that will protect their own domestic industries from international uh, competition. It is the fact that these countries do not have the financial capacity to say no to multinational corporations when they demand lower regulations and lower uh, tax rates for international companies, let's say, right? And through this, we've identified that the issue is not with smart people not being in the labor market. It's not even about the labor market at all, but rather it is about the fact that the structure of the government policy is not in place. How do we improve that on our side of the house? So this is a third argument, right? We've told you on our side of the house that we're completely fine with people spending spending time abroad because that's part of their freedom, right? And through that freedom, there are plenty of other ways for these individuals to, to pursue their responsibilities as citizens or people who originated from that country, right? We see many countries where you impose tax on overseas nationals, and this is one thing we could do. We could also expect remittances because uh, supposedly even people from Ghana, let's say, they still have families in Ghana, so they probably have some uh, familial obligation to send money back. Yes? Uh, so the reason why WTO imposes certain uh, restrictions on these countries is precisely because these countries are dependent upon one monoculture, and the reason why they're dependent on that is lack of po knowledgeable population. We think we uniquely get to solve that problem. Uh, the World Trade Organization is a shit neoliberal institution. Even if that were the case, there was, even if what you said was the case, the fact that if, if that was the case, the fact is that is resulting in a structure in which you give more power to the rich countries, to the wealthy countries, and you disadvantage the countries which don't have the policies to defend against that. So as a result, you're basically supporting our side. Anyway, what does that mean? Remitting this money coming in. For example, when you have people who spent lots of time abroad and maybe in their latter years after retiring come back to countries of origin, let's say something like that, what you have is, for example, the inflow of high skills and high technology that you spent as a result of working right after in the university education overseas, or you get more income based from which you can tax. Basically, that means more money flowing from places like America to Ghana's government tax coffers. Um, government coffers, it means more connections from like people from Ghana having with people like uh, professionals and academia professionals and business leaders from America. Basically, you get more power in terms of money, in terms of connections, in order to create such policies where government has more money to now say, we will not buy into your lobbying techniques, we will protect our industry, those sort of things. And that's how we develop, not grow random people into a structural mess. Thank you. to realize is that these individuals have a moral obligation 
to actually give back to the people of their countries because the very money, the very reason that they're able to go to these elite universities to begin with is because of money that they stole from the people, right? It's because of things like public money, it's because of things like exploitation, it's because of things like historical plunder that these individuals have done, that they have the resources to actually go to these universities to begin with. We think that in the instance where they have taken money from that people, they also have an obligation to give it back in the form of labor, in the form of actually helping these countries develop. So I have two substantiates in my speech today. Firstly, white individuals have the moral obligation to give back to the countries where they came from. And secondly, how this, um, how this plan is going to lead to better development, and what is the exact mechanism of that? So firstly, about moral obligation. So OT said you, uh, these individuals are privileged, therefore we, they also have the obligation to give back to their countries. But capacity doesn't necessarily equal obligation. So we're going to take a step further and talk about why these people actually have a reciprocal duty to the people of their country. And this also directly clashes with O's argument, as in you cannot use people as a tool. We're going to show you why these people are actually morally obligated in this instance. So we think that there are really two types of people who go to university, right? Firstly, about individuals who go to the local elite universities. And what you have to understand about developing countries is that, especially late developing countries, places like Uganda, Congo, Nigeria, is that they cannot implement mass education because they have lack the resources to build lots of schools and hire tons of teachers, right? So what they do is they focus an immense number of resources on elite education. Yes, Some countries only have one university within their countries and they focus all their education resources upon that one university. So they devote a lot of resources for these individuals, right? We think that in that case, if these individuals are beneficiaries of that immense amount of public money, they also have the moral obligation to actually use that education to actually give back to that country, right? And secondly, about individuals who go to foreign universities, we think that these individuals are also responsible because the very reason why these people are able to afford to go abroad in the first place is because they're the children of people like elites, elites as in like politicians or local companies or the CEOs of local companies, right? And we think that's sources of those income. The very reason they can go abroad and get that good education and good income to begin with was because of plunder and exploitation. I'll take you in a second. And we think that's the income that comes from a corrupt system that takes money away from people's tax or takes uh, cuts pies off of development budgets and instead allocates that into their own income or allocates that into their own pocket money. We think in systems like, for example, accepting bribes from multinational corporations who receive loose environmental labor laws in return at the expense of poor struggling people on the ground who have to face the consequences of that pollution and the consequences of those extremely cheap wages. Or we think this CEOs of local corporations who force local workers to work for extremely, extremely low wages and polluted environments. These people have systematically profited from exploiting the poor and the country's resources. We think that in that case, especially because in the case of university, we think that it's high skills high-skilled labor that these third world countries absolutely need to develop. We think that these individuals have you know, because they have stolen money and rights from the people, they also have the obligation to give it back. So we think that they do have a moral obligation to give back to these people to open. Uh, policies favoring the elite in government funding is not exclusive to developing countries. Do you think that you and I have an obligation to Japan to suddenly force ourselves to stay in Japan, contribute to Japan entirely, just because of the reciprocal relation that we've got? The difference is that these people are able to go to these universities. These people have access to elite universities and are working as fishermen, as uh, farmers, because they have exploited the people on the ground. We think that's completely different from places like Japan or completely different from like developed nations, right? So moving on to my second point about how this plan will lead to development. So we have to understand the status quo is that yes, there are structural reasons why development is failing, and a lot of those structural reasons have to do with the lack of educated personnel and an educated workforce, right? I think that there are two uh, layers of analysis here. Firstly, we think that because they have a lack of an educated uh, workforce, they have things like failing development projects, failing fiscal policies, wasteful city planning, because of the lack of experts who know about things like economy, who actually know about and study, have studied about fiscal policies, right? We think that a um and we think that that leads to bad outcomes, right? Because A, you have uneducated people. What you have is there's uneducated people administering these projects, right? You have bad planning for cities, which leads to things like air pollution because they didn't think about the structures of the city. You have things like bad city planning because they don't have things like competitive bidding, so they're actually throwing away 
a lot of money when they build cities, right? They have tons of money that could have been used on things like other development projects, that could have been used on things like actually giving better uh, money, giving better care to the poor, being thrown away or wasted because these people simply don't know how to carry out an actually good development plan. And B, we think that in the case, or, or we think another scenario that happens is that these corporations rely on multinational corporations for things like development or for things like fiscal policies, which we think is also really bad, right? Because multinational corporations don't have any incentive to care about these third world countries, right? They only care about their own income and their own profit. So what they do is they go in and they destroy the environment, no thank you, they corrupt the government, they pollute the environment, they exploit workers, and they exploit resources, and they take, and after they suck up all the resources and have completely polluted the environment, they just simply go out and leave, right? We think that the alternatives that they use is quite bad. And secondly, and more softer, we think that the lack of doctors and law of doctors and teachers and these small sort of elites also harm the country, right? If you look at the Africa and the status quo, where they're having a huge Ebola outbreak, but don't have enough doctors to actually take care of the patients, or the lack of teachers, which leads to a lack of educated workforce, this also not just takes away lives, it also harms the development, right? Because when you have things like Ebola, corporations are not going to be likely to want to come into your country and actually invest there if the people are dying, if nobody is willing to go in there because there's things like Ebola, um, uh, right? Malaria, right? When you have a lack of an educated workforce, you have less people who can act, who can call, you have less educated workforce that can call it good corporations, which leads to development in the long term, right? The fact is that these developing countries cannot develop because there are no teachers, because waste of funds are being wasted, because there are no leaders to actually lead these products, right? So how does this change by taking this motion? So we think that when we take this motion, these educated people are going to remain within the country, right? And yes, we can see that not all the structural problems will be resolved on our side of the house, but we say it's comparatively better than what happens in the opposition paradigm, right? Because when you have teachers to increase more educated workforces, when you have innovators who create local industries, people who pass smart fiscal policies and negotiate with WTO or IMF or the neoliberals, right? Because they understand diplomacy and they can create smart ta tax policies that multinationals can't run away from. You have better, more local industries that create jobs. You have smarter diplomacy that, in that furthers national interests. You have more resources for people, more doctors to save people's lives, better diplomacy, development and strategies that lift people out of poverty. You have less waste and better leaders, right? We thought that was a preferable world compared to what happens on opposition paradigm. And for these reasons, Government fund tools will work well because they debate on a very narrow interpretation, right? OG and because there's no extension of CG as well. Talk about reciprocity and how they're going to be called resources. And that's why we have to hold individuals accountable. I think two levels of analysis. Number one, this only extends to public universities, right? I pay seven million and want to go into university, but the government doesn't do shit for into university. So I don't really see how people who pay private tuition to universities have this obligation towards the government. But number two, when they choose to focus their characterization on countries like Uganda and Senegal, which are the most extreme of these nations, we think there's more incentives for people to leave. Because the problem becomes more severe in government corruption, the problem becomes more severe that I would rather leave my citizenship and start a new future abroad, right? But second, we think that they also have to expand their cases to countries like the Philippines and Vietnam, where education is prominent and people are still educated in college level, but choose to leave for countries like the United States, right? We think there's just blatant uncharacterization happening from the government, I think off-bench has to go, right? But even within the off-bench, I don't think O is brave enough to bite the bullet on brain drain, because they're dependent on this idea of benevolence as to why people are going to return. We're going to provide a much more layered analysis as to why people are, why even if not everyone comes back, still some people are going to come back, and that could lead to the benefit that the government bench wants as a whole. Three, three um, elaborations I want to do in my speech. Number one, the principal justification as to what are the explosive harms of negative reinforcement. Second, the structural problem as to how we achieve solvency. Finally, how do you incentivize people to remain a contributor to the economy, right? Talking first about the inclusive harms of negative reinforcement. Because the question that all people have to ask inside this debate, and I'm quite surprised no one has answered, is the question of when does the government force you to stay, right? That's when that you, as a citizen, make a violation of trust and a social contract that leads to tangible harms to others, right? That's the reason why criminals are banned from leaving the country, right? We don't think citizens that are leaving the country have committed a crime. They have been the capitalists between choosing to live in a current country with loved ones, speaking the language that they are confident in and having money, and a life in an alien nation with, with no close ties, speaking no money and having like having no money, right? We think that in that trade-off, if the future is still better in the latter, these people have made that trade-off. We think that it's a structural problem that you should not place 
the blame on individuals, right? Because even especially under the characterization that closing government talks about, in corrupt government, they need to prove why this burden is on the individual to go hold the government accountable, right? We don't think there was any solvency in their mechanism as well, right? Because we think that the only wrongdoing of these individuals was losing the losing the birth lottery, so not being fortunate enough to go to a country where the government is able to take care of their education, is able to take care of their employment. We don't see why individuals have to be burdened with this kind of punishment. But second, we're going to be the responsible opposition here and look at the case studies of how developing countries in the past, right? How in the, in the past developed, right? Korea in the 1970s, under the dictator of dictatorship of Park Jong-in, he sent those who were willing to Germany, who were willing to work to Germany to work as nurses and miners, and they brought back foreign currency that was able to build railroads and factories. We don't think there was any case where these people were forced to like stay into their country and work in a future where there is no where there is no like um bright future, right? But second, even if they're like perhaps more closer historical narratives, in terms of Poland, after joining the European Union, they experienced a very vast great great rate as the youth escaped to neighboring countries, right? They incentivized those to stay by lowering the income tax, and now you're able to see a constant number of youth remaining, right? The impact of this argument is if you force people to stay, there's going to be a negative impression of the nation. Because now this country is not only the country that cannot provide a stable piece of future for me, but is now preventing me from having a future that I want in the country that I desire, right? This pushes people to escape permanently. This pushes people to get to the ship in other countries where they're able to start a family without this demonization of the individual the government is pressuring to do so. We think there's no elaboration on how that's going to harm the individual happening on government side, right? Second, we're going to talk about the structural problem. Because even if the government forces them to stay and provide jobs, we think they're going to leave as soon as that time is over. Because the problem isn't youth, isn't youth unemployment. It's the fact that there is no future in the country, even for the best of the best and the elite people. Right? That's the reason why after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russian scientists went to the United Nations, United States to work as janitors, even though they gave away their jobs with high education and whatnot, right? Why is why is this harmful, right? Because we're going to we're going to talk about the brain drain on multiple levels of analysis, right? We think that brain drain is difficult on both sides, but we're still going to provide a comparison as to why it's better, right? Number one, why is the benefit of individuals leading and providing uh, and getting a better future abroad impossible under side government, right? Because we think that it's it's because the elite and the smart youth who have the potential to succeed abroad ultimately lose the crucial first few years of their work, right? They should enter graduate school, they should become um, they should become employed. But now they're deprioritized compared to students who work inside that home country who have qualified work experience, right? Because even if you work as a government or, or like person, or even if you work in a company, it's in a very, very developed, 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 developed nation that the government characterizes, it's not going to provide you a competitive edge, right? That's the exclusive harm happening under government that you lose that funding point that, that prevents you from competing with other people, right? But the level of analysis as to why this brain drain is going to happen, we think that it ended at a goodwill analysis coming from opening opposition and multi mechanism further in this debate, right? Number one, neither does it can confirm or certainly say that all people were trained, or none, none of the people were trained, right? In that case, CEO bites the bullet and say that even if we might have less people, it's not the number of people that count, it's actually who they are and what they want to be, right? Because ultimately, the brain drain is going to depend on individual capitalism. Are you going to prioritize family, or are you going to prioritize patriotism in a country over those that can safely come back, right? But if you think it's second, there's also things like positive reinforcement, because students who have studied business and tech can utilize the knowledge of their local resources to start new factories and businesses, and these, they can return to the developing countries where they're able to have the resources and the knowledge to ultimately capitalize on resources, right? But thirdly, we think that there's also negative reinforcement at stake, because discrimination exists even for the most successful immigrants, sure. Um, you said, you know, you need to commit a crime in order for government to justify constraining people's rights. Do you oppose things like conscription, which is done in your nation? We don't think that's a very important thing to matter here, right? Because we don't think number one, that's in the constitution, or number two, the idea that you're coming as a citizen to work inside the nation is is like a crime that you can put this person on. I don't think that's any relevance at this debate, right? But finally, we think that the idea of discrimination still exists for the most successful immigrant, right? That's the reason why Chinese American immigrants come back to their home country after experiencing discrimination, after understanding that there's, there's an inability to become promoted in their side of the house, if there's further incentives for their people to return to these home countries, right? Under that narrative, why are we able to achieve more, the more structural problem, structural solution at the end of the day, right? Because under these kind of calculus, and providing like other alternatives like the government being able to reduce tax cuts and tax or for startups and the youth and being able to provide connections to reduce, to like, to retrieve like resource extraction, we think that ultimately these people are going to return and become the wealthy elite. They're going to create the factories, the businesses, and the foundation for education and science that all sides of the end, all sides of the house want to achieve, right? In that case, we think that it's ultimately more beneficial as more and more people 
become unemployed, as more and more people become educated, and we're able to see the macroeconomic level of the country able to grow. We don't think that can happen when education abroad is being limited because you're forcing students to stay after their graduation. We don't see any level of change or any level of bright future happening outside government. That's the reason why you have to vote for small. countries like Chad, Uganda, or Mali, those countries who are oftentimes referred to as bottom billion, is characterized as concentrating money on individual privileged few in expecting them to contribute back to society but being betrayed by the same people. We think the unending cycle of producing educated and letting them fly away has to stop at this day and that's why we're very happy to propose. Causing government told you that firstly, how our education system is unique in these nations which justifies countries to constrain their ability to uh, the, the, the right to freedom, but secondly, why educated people, precisely in university, is particularly necessary for the development of these countries. I'm going to ask two questions in this speech. First, is this justified for governments to constrain the uh, movements of these individuals in this particular instance? Secondly, is this effective for the development of these nations? But before that, a couple of responses to opposition bench. First thing that they said, and this was quite nit nitpicking, like gov gov argument, was that you know these people would just re uh, just do away with their citizenship, so you get you don't get constrained. Obviously, we're not going to allow these uh, these these people to do away with citizenship or whatsoever. We, the reason why we can enforce this restriction in that instance as well is precisely because we can suspend the assets that they have in these nations. We think the workability still exists on our paradigm. We think we get to constrain people who even go to other universities abroad who are willing to do away with their citizenship. But they said, you know, people will start losing their first year of um, work and that's going to be a, a, a disadvantage for these people. Um, quite clearly, no, because if you look at countries like Singapore, these, the people in Singapore have to suffer two years addition, additional like, as, like as service in military, so they literally lose out on two years of their advantage. Yet they succeed in places like business, places, in places like United States or the United Kingdom. We don't necessarily think that two years is so important to the extent of constraining them to the end of their life. The last thing that they said was a brain drain will happen on the uh, brain, brain drain will happen anyway, so there's no change. No, the question is what the comparative is in, into this scenario. Comparative is other opposition side of because people don't have incentive to work in these nations anymore, they're not going to work with these nations at all. On the other side of the house, what we can achieve at the very least is we get to constrain these people to these countries to work for the nation for five or ten years. We think that is the comparative benefit that exists on our island. So it's not just enough for them to say brain drain will happen anyway. Um, so first question. Is it justified to constrain these people in this particular instance? What opening opposition and presumably closing opposition said was, you know, individuals have rights to freedom, individuals have right to self-actualization. Opening government responded to this by saying, well, it's temporary, so it's fine. It also, they said, the sense of belonging enhances the happiness of individuals. The question, therefore, in today's debate was, to what extent can you, can you constrain these individuals? Because that was the premise of uh, like the, uh, like the analogy of opening opposition. Because what they said was education basically is for liberation, therefore you, should, you don't have any justification to constrain these people in countries like Japan. Kanan told you that education policy is significantly different to that of developed nations in developed nations. Because what we told you was developing nations, the policy with regards to education in developing nations is different from policies in developed nations in the sense that it is a development policy, not one of self-actualization. What do we mean by this? We mean things like concentrating their money to one university because they don't have the capacity capacity to do mass education, which means education is not provided on an equal basis to the population at all. For instance, Ken, like in, in the country of Kenya, people who belong to Kikutu ethnicity is prioritized in every stages that they have access to education because the government chooses to pick on these individuals to bring to like raise elites from that particular ethnicity. So the fact that education is not at all like, provided on an equal basis, no thank you, means that these, these governments are like focusing money upon few individuals in order to create elites in order for their development. So that basically the compromise of like individual uh, ability for like uh, for the sake of development is what's happening in these nations. We think therefore the situation is significantly different between developed and developing nations in this instance. No, thank you. 
But then they said, you know, foreign universities, private universities, they, they just subsidize themselves. Why do you have the justification from Australia? Look, the reason why these people can access these universities, the reason why people can access private universities, is first, firstly, as we told you, is precisely because of things like corruption, which meant that these people are significantly privileged at the expense of others. But more generally, the people who have access to the education, people who have the capital to bring to like be educationally, uh, to have like good education, was people who, for instance, belong to a privileged ethnicity like Kikutu in Kenya, who had been privileged of like uh, of, like government providing the resources. To these nations, we think the fact that they were privileged, uh, like in comparison to other ethnicities, meant that the reason meant that they had obligation to bring uh, bring back benefit for the other people as well. The last thing closing options have had, no thank you. What's that? Birth lottery. So you shouldn't constrain these people, but but based on the fact that they were born to these nations. Look, we think that it's true that we constrain them based on birth lottery. But I think it's also true that when you don't take this policy, the more underprivileged people, for instance, the people who do not have access to education at all in these nations, would be constrained to poverty for all. So we don't necessarily think why constraining the more privileged in this instance is necessarily worse off. Um, any clear eyes? Hopefully. You do realize that Tokyo University gets more funds than any other public university. Every single country, regardless of developed or developing, prioritizes one academic field or one university or whatnot to create at least to lead leading industries, right? Where's the significant difference? Uh, so look, there's a significant difference, right? Because in countries like Tokyo, in country, in country, not, not Tokyo, in countries like <laughs> <laughs> America, one thing, the, 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 the judgment that they make, the decision they make, is based on the academic ability of those individuals. That is significantly different in these nations, in which people who are privileged, who are people who were elites from the Beginning are given lots of money, not based on their ability, but the based on the fact that they were elite, the based on the fact that they were privileged in the first instance. That was the difference between two paradigms. So, second question: um, Is this effective for development at the end of the day? Um, what the government said was basically they fly away, and when you give to keep them, the, the poverty is magically solved. What we told you uniquely from closing government was the mechanism through which developing nations can achieve change in this instance. What we told you was that these countries suffer from serious lack of knowledge of the population. Yeah. And we, when we, sup uh, when we uh, supply these nations with things like teacher, you get to achieve uh, like meaningful development. So what we told you, for instance, was that the reason why these countries are poor, and well, this is something that, that directly passes to opening opposition, like the reason why these countries are poor because of structural reasons. The reason why structural reasons continue to constrain these nations is precisely because of lack of people who are literate, lack of people who, who can do like things like mathematics. The reason why they, they, they don't have that ability in the first instance is because these nations do not have a population that can educate the population. We think when you get like people who are educated enough to go to university, you get to you get to teach people, you get to educate people, which then opens the door for like diversification of industry, which currently isn't the prevalent, unfortunately, in these nations, which constrains the population to simple manual labor, which precisely is the reason why structural reasons, structural factors constrain these nations. The last thing that they said was basically, you know, alternative exists. No, notice that remittances, the, remi the, 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 the kinds of remittances that you can expect from these individuals are remittances that go back to the privilege of these like, uh, developing nations. So you don't necessarily get the money from the other people on the ground. But secondly, yeah, things like aid, these are sequestered obtained by the wealthy few. For instance, 99% of the aid that goes to Chad gets like, obtained by the few that doesn't necessarily reach the people on the ground. So we think human resources is more effective, human resources is the only way to achieve change in development issues. We think it's totally justified in government control, we think it's necessary for these people to develop, and that's why it affects our folks. while it's a government's failure that you guys mentioned. 
Quoting from CG member, it's a failing fiscal policy, lack of educational resources, and bad city planning that this is all happening. It's a structural problem that an individual should be blamed for having a very free choice of individual calculus. Second level of clarification, we think that's a very nationalist and a very dangerous logic that the government abuse to use to demonize the individual, demonize the privileged class, rather than recognizing and solving the problem in a deliberate manner. Secondly, we think that also they have to also clarify how these undergraduates in developing countries can actually solve the problems of bad city planning, failing fiscal policies, sure. or whatnot. Because like as an econ major myself, I learned supply and demand, micro, macro, and shit, but I don't think after I graduate, especially after graduating undergrad, I don't think I can I can solve these problems precisely. I don't think I'm gonna be able to work immediately in industrial banks, financial sectors, like improve the country and save my country or whatnot. We think it's a better solution than CO and opposition bench as a whole for these individuals to have a chance or opportunity, well, especially in those who are staying in foreign universities like MIT or UCLA, to use the important, important critical period of their life to do job training, to use that opportunity to better self-actualize. We think that's better for that country. That's gonna be our extension more mentioned further on. Now, what's the burden of proof that the government should have? Firstly, they have the principal burden of proof to justify how government can forcibly decide the, the boundary of free occupation, the boundary of one's freedom. We don't think that's, this is actively done by any of the houses. OG tells you by three principles. Firstly, it's a temporary period. Secondly, they are privileged class, which is derivative by CG as well. Thirdly, they're using the tax money also by CG as well. So firstly, temporary period. We don't think that's simply a justification to force an individual to stay in the country. Are you going to say Nazis like temporarily use the Jews for two or maybe three months during their occupation. Do you think they can be justified because it's a temporary period? Secondly, just because there's a privileged class, we don't think that bring, we think that especially if you don't want to use the privileged class, we don't think demonizing them would be the best way to um, like make them stay. But because like because especially because given that it's a temporary <coughs> period, we think that the more antagonist sentiment would be happening, more brain drain would happen. Especially when we're talking about those privileged people who are like studying in like MIT, UCLA, or whatnot, these people have a higher tendency to now think, oh, these countries demonizing me, forcing me to come back, while I need to have more time time to spend training with my schools or go to grad school or whatnot. We think that they have a higher possibility to change the nationality or whatnot. Then your marginal benefit of, oh, we have progressive taxing, we're gonna tax them overseas, that would also be gone on your side of the house. Thirdly, no thank you. Tax money is used or whatnot. We think this is just principally wrong. The reason why government the reason why government levy and impose tax in the first place is to subsidize those public universities or whatnot. It's not the other way around. You cannot say that individual, you have an obligation because you went to a university that was subsidized by the government. They didn't even clarify public university or private university here, here. or whatnot, right? And even if it's only talking about public university, we think it's not the obligation of the individual because the government took an imposed tax given the fact that they're going to return it by subsidizing university. We don't think that's the other way around. Secondly, we think that practical linkage is also missing. Given that they all lose in principle justification, if they can prove marginally, how can they solve the problem of structural problem? I think maybe probably they have a chance to win. But we don't think that's happening, right? Because we think, we think they're using a very negative mechanism to forcibly like force individuals to be there. However, the CEO uniquely provides you how we have a better incentivization mechanism by changing the individual calculus by saying that um, instead of temporary detainment, we're going to solve the structural problem um, or whatnot. For example, we think that, um, yeah, and also moving on to now characterization. We agree with problem identification as the problem is about lack of infrastructure, structural problem, or whatnot. People, we don't agree with the problem analysis as to why that's happening. That's not happening because of low birth rate or few workers on blue collar workers. That's happening rather because government failed structural incentivization, welcoming more FDIs, welcoming more startups to build in their country, right? We have to shift the individual calculus by, oh, oh talked about how goodwill and benevolence patriotism can work. We're gonna expand it further by giving a strategic incentivization structure, such as lower taxing for domestic youth in that country, by providing a linkage such as extraction rights or mining to use the resources in such developing countries or whatnot, right? Now, comparative comes in. So they talked about how o, like OG talked about how these can like solve these structural problems or whatnot. A, they lacked principle, but B also they lacked mechanism as to how they can solve prove the solvency. They didn't mention, but even if they didn't mention, they don't have to mention the period of time of detainment. They should have provided how whether it's activated immediately, because our member told you how it's a critical time of their life mm -hmm. to, to develop self actualization, to have more human capital. We don't think that human capital develops sees the moment one's graduate from undergrad, right? Secondly, also what kind of 
job sectors are these kind of people working? Is the government going to provide jobs by also at the same time having them forcing to do so? Because we think it's a very irresponsible government to make them sustain and detain in a certain boundary while they're not providing any job training, not providing any job sectors to work in, right? Now, before that, um, uh, look, doctors can work as doctors, but notice that you do not need to engage in your profession in these nations because general characteristics shared by the graduates of the university is that they're literate and also that they're highly knowledgeable in general. We think that the motion clearly states that they're going to have them temporarily forced to work. You cannot just say that. They're not going to be working. They have a freedom to choose between the occupation or whatnot. Because if your solvency is to solve the problem of the structural problems, there must be a certain sector that you want to target. Rather by saying that, oh, we don't have a specific target. We don't, not, we're okay if they choose their major or whatnot. We don't think that's the solvency to do so, right? Also, we think that we provide a unique incentivization mechanism where government provides an active positive like way or incentive for these people to work. As we told you, it's not the number of people that stay in the country that solves this problem, but the quality of human capital and taking one step further than, than just staying in the country, right? We want these foreign university graduates to actively use their ties, actively use internship programs in their side, uh, in our side, and also we want to have incentivization policies that would better make them take one step further. We don't think that it's the number of 100, 100 university graduates that's going to solve the problem of bad fiscal policy or whatnot. We think this is quality of human capital as well as active human active incentivization mechanism that can change the calculus that would actually change the model, right? And now, just using my brief time, also we talked about like conscription and whatnot, three levels of responses. Firstly, it's in the constitution, there is a social consensus behind it. B, we think that it's directly related to national defense, right? One soldier would probably like aggregate the national defense one more. We don't think that one student, undergrad student, would directly lead to one better schools or whatnot. We don't think that linkage is absolutely missing. Thirdly, we have an honor prestige by celebrating veterans Celebrating the US seal, what we don't see any kind of prestige bridge. We are just seeing demonizing people um, just because of the fact that they are prestige and just because that just because of the fact that they lost the third lottery, that's why we are so proud to oppose. Thank you very much.